Welcome to Epic Space Models. In this episode, I will show you how the grid fin mechanism works using only paper and pencil. Let's get started. The most complicated part of this model is the grid fin mechanism. One of the reasons why it is complicated is that each fin has two different motions. So we need two different motors, or in this case several motors, to actuate just one fin. The first motion is the folding and unfolding of the fin. And this happens just after the separation of the booster from the upper stage. The second motion is the rotation of the fin around its axis. So this changes the angle of attack of the fin with respect to the airflow, provided control authority needed to steer the booster during the descent. So, how do we do that? Okay, so when you are doing 3D modeling, especially 3D modeling with moving parts, I highly recommend that you first start by drawing a sketch on paper before jumping into your favorite 3D modeling software. So, first, let's uh, consider the folding unfolding motion of the fin. So here, I'm going to draw the fin in two different configurations. So, the first one is the folded configuration where the fin is folding along the side of the booster. So, seen from this side, the fin looks like this. And the core of the booster is here. So this part is inside of the booster, and this part is outside of the booster. <coughs> In the unfolded configuration, the fin looks like this and the booster is here so again this is outside and this is inside of the booster so we need a way to have this fin change from this configuration to this configuration so basically we want it to rotate 90 degrees from this vertical configuration to this horizontal configuration. So in order to have a rotating motion, we need a hinge. So as you might remember from the previous video, we created a hinge here. So that this fin can rotate around this axis um, where it is connected to its hub. So this hinge here, this hinge here correspond to this point here. So that these parts rotate around this axis from this position to this position. Okay, so now the problem is that this fin is not going to move by itself. So we need to have a motor or a servo motor or anything that uh, makes it move. So the easiest way to do it would be to have a servo motor directly connected to this hinge here. So to have the servo motor, the axis of the servo motor aligned with the axis of the hinge here and here. The problem is that if we do that, we are going to have a bulky servo motor outside of the rocket and we definitely do not want to have that. So what we want to have is to uh, place the servo motor not outside but inside of the interstage so that it is hidden and you cannot see the servo motor from the outside. So uh, let's place the output shaft of servo motor here. And now we have to be creative and somehow connect this fin here to this servo motor here. This hinge here to this servo motor here. So, as you might remember from the previous video, I added a second hinge to the fin, which is in diagonal from the previous one. So there's a, hin a hinge here, which is connected to the fin. So when the fin rotates around its axis here, this hinge here is going to move like this and come here. And again, it is rigidly connected to the fin. So this means that if we have something that pulls on this hinge here in the right direction, this is going to apply a force here 
the force will create a torque around this axis here and all the thing is going to swing from this configuration to this configuration. So to do that, I create a link here, like this. Then I attach an arm to the output shaft of the servo motor. And I create a hinge between the two. So now what's happening is that when the axis of the shaft of the servo motor rotates, it's going to rotate the arm here, pull on this link in this direction. This is going to pull this hinge in this direction and all of this part here is going to rotate from the vertical configuration to the horizontal configuration. So if I draw this mechanism in the l 4 configuration, this servo arm moves from this angle to this angle here. And the link here moves from here to here. So it does not move in a straight line. It moves more like this because it is attached to two arms that are rotating around hinges. And finally, this is the body of the servo motor. So by doing this, we have the servo motor inside of the interstage and the part that is visible from the outside is only this hinge here and just the tip of the linkage. So this is how we are going to have the fin actuated to create the, uh, this motion from the folded configuration to the unfolded configuration. So now that we have an idea of how we are going to do the folding and unfolding motion of the fin, let's think about the second motion, which is the pitch motion of the fin. So the, the one that is actually used to steer the booster. So here again, I will draw the fin in two different configurations so that we can see uh, what kind of uh, motion we have and what mechanism we need to realize it. So on the left side, I draw the fin when the pitch is at zero degree. So seen from the side or let's say from the front it would look like this. So the fin is unfolded. This is the tip of the fin and behind of this is the, uh, the booster. So when the fin rotates, let's say to 55 degrees, so this fin here is going to move around this hinge and rotate so that it comes to this position. And of course it can move back and forth. So again here, the easiest way to do it would be to have a servo motor here directly connected to uh, this hinge. So to have the axis, the shaft of the servo motor aligned with the hinge here. So, this is what I wanted to do at the beginning and I realized after that it would be impossible because of the size of the interstage. So the problem here is, is that, okay, if I draw the interstage from the top, so we have here the core of the booster and we have four fins all around. So each fin has a mechanism, link, and servo motor to make it fold and unfold. So this is here, 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 and this is connected. So these four blocks here are the, the parts that make the fin 
like fold and unfold um, and that we, we draw in the previous section. And now we need uh, additional servo motor to make all of these rotates um, plus minus 40 degrees. So if we were to directly connect the new servo motor to this system, we would need to place them here. And you can see here that it's overlapping here. And that's exactly what would happen, is that because of the size of the interstage, which is in this case um, nine centimeter in diameter, we just don't have enough space in the middle to cram four additional servo motors. So it might be possible if I chose to use smaller servo motors, but the smaller you get, the less torque you have, and also the less reliable the servo motors are because they, they have very, very tiny gear and they wear out pretty quickly. So um, it's not possible to directly connect the servo motor to the, um, to the rest of the mechanism. So we have to be smarter than that. So instead of putting the servo motor at the center of the interstage, we're going to put them not in line with this axis, but below this part, so that we can free space in the middle. So let's go back to the previous drawing. So we know that we are not going to connect the motor directly to this hinge. So we need to place the servo motor below the uh, fin mechanism and have something that connects the two. So let's say that the servo motor, the shaft of the servo motor is here and here. So, okay, for example, if I have an arm attached to the head of the servo motor, like this, and a hinge here, I can have a linkage from here to here. So that when the arm of the servo motor rotates like this, it pulls this linkage down, this pulls this hinge down, and the fin rotates uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay, if I draw the same mechanism in the uh, 45 degree configuration, this looks something like this. Okay, so theoretically this would work and this might work in the real world. But one of the problems with this kind of design is that by putting on this link here, this servo motor is going to apply a force onto this hinge here as well. Because this force applied here has to be compensated by the reaction force of the hinge here. So we have a force applied here. And each time you apply a force to a hinge, you're going to have friction. And because we don't have ball bearings here, we have a contact between plastic and plastic, the friction coefficient is pretty high. So with this design, we might, we might have a very high friction. And if you have friction, it means that the parts are going to wear out pretty quickly. And if there is too much friction, it might not be able to move at all. So you have to be smarter than that. So instead of just one link here, I'm going to create a symmetrical design. So extend this arm here on the other side and have a second linkage here. And do the same for the 45 degree configuration. And connect it with a second linkage. So this kind of connection is sometimes called a push-pull and it is used for example in radio control aircrafts. 
So what's happening now is that when the arm of the servo motor rotates here, it's going to pull this linkage here, and at the same time, it's going to push this one here. So what happens on the top part of the system is that you have one link which is pulled here, so it applies a force downward. The other one is pushed, so it applies a force upward. And the resulting force on the center of the part, where you have the, the hinge, is theoretically zero. In the real world, it's going to be pretty close to zero. So this means that by having this symmetrical mechanism, you can transmit almost a pure torque from the servo motor here to the fin here. So we, because the resulting force here is almost zero, we are going to have very low friction. So we can be pretty confident that this system is going to work even if we have a small servo motor here. Um, but there's a catch. In physics and engineering, there's always a catch. And the catch here is that because we now have a closed geometric loop, we have some geometric constraints between the position of the hinge here and the position of the servo motor shaft here. So I'm not going to go into the details of what's happening and how to, to handle this problem, but just to put in short, because we have constraint because the, between the position of the hinge here and the position of the servo motor here, here, we have to be careful about how we are going to attach the hinge here to the rest of the interstage. Thank you for watching. In the next episode, we will model the actual mechanism in Fusion 360. So don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.